Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com. We're broadcasting live from New York City this week. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. As always, please keep your questions coming to us. The Final Bar at StockCharts.com is the best way to get questions our way or during the show today, uh, you know, put any questions in the Q&A session. We're going to get to as many questions as we can in our mailbag segments for sure. This has been a really, really cool uh, week in New York for the Stock Charts TV team. Our bittersweet to uh, to head back uh, to Seattle tomorrow to uh, rejoin the family, but very good to see them for sure. Uh, but it's been just such a cool week. Uh, we've had some really fantastic conversations, and today we're going to share with you part of a conversation with Tony Dwyer that was really, really good. He's a sharp analyst. He does a lot on financial media and social media and uh, really knows his stuff. He's more of a strategist. And we asked him some really cool questions about how the current market compares to other historical periods and did a really good job of lining up where we're at right now versus the late 90s, which I think you're, you're not going to want to miss. Um, we were actually on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange uh, yesterday and then again this morning, had a really good conversation. We'll look to share with you our conversation with Jay Woods, who's one of the executive floor governors uh, in the coming coming days and weeks for uh, for sure. Interesting day in the markets. Uh, let's get to the market recap. Uh, a fun day to be on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. We actually had an IPO, uh, Bill.com, that came out. I'd, I'd not been on the floor during an IPO before. That was actually pretty cool. And we asked uh, Jay a lot about the process of the IPO from the perspective of the floor brokers and how it actually evolves. Um, what's funny, though, is you know, as we're at the desk, as we're at his post talking about the dynamics, talking about his role and everything, the Trump tweet comes out about uh, the China, U.S.-China deal uh, very, being very, very soon and, uh, and, and resolving pretty positively. And you could just see things erupt as the market shot higher. So looking at a chart of the S&P 500, it's on my me member dashboard screen. You, know, you can see the move uh, you know, pretty aggressively out of the open, kind of came up very nicely. And then a bit of a sell-off here down to around 3150 but then plenty of resilience as uh, we sort of recovered finished toward the highs of the days, not quite at the high, but but pretty decent. And the S&P up 86 basis points or 0.86%. Uh, pretty impressive day for sure. And that, uh, you know, that uh, that news on the US-China trade deal, you know, pretty impressive. You know, what, what's interesting to me, and I talked to Tony a little bit about this, I forget if it's gonna be in one of the segments we'll share with you today, but, you know, we talked about the dynamics of that and, you know, how much of that is really priced into the market versus, you know, how quickly something like this that came out today obviously provides a short-term boost but is it sustainable? Is it going to provide further strength over time? Or is it the optimism of this deal more already baked in? I think that's the question that's unresolved uh, at this point. Looking at the market activity, though, the S&P up 0.86%, uh, mid caps up a little more, 1.04, and small caps about the same, 1.06%. So, you know, small cap, mid cap leadership over large cap, which is, again, more in the traditional look that you would uh, you would sort of uh, sort of expect here. Let's look at the chart of the S&P 500 to see how today's movement lined up into uh, into everything else. So this is today's bar. Certainly feels exaggerated based on just the volatility relative to other, uh, you know, just the last uh, year, the very few days that have had a range wider than uh, today's, which is very, very telling. Obviously, plenty of accumulation on the on the broad market news, plenty of stocks looking pretty attractive based just on today's price action. And, and obviously, the question is going to be, uh, you know, tomorrow and then into next week, what sort of follow through do we get uh, from that upswing? But the S&P achieving new price highs, new closing highs, closing just below 3170 for the first time. So overall, you know, very constructive. And, you know, I was on Bloomberg TV yesterday and we were talking about uh, the market environment. I want to share with you just a, one of the snippets or, or just one of the, the comments that I made to put it into, into context. But you know, the, the concern I have is just where we're at and and how, even though the long-term uptrend can still be positive, we can still have some short-term weakness in there. And I think if we do, that'll be pretty unexpected because most people I'm talking to are pretty bolt up. I mean, it's pretty positive out there. There are a lot of people upgrading their price targets, including Tony Dwyer, who we hear from. He has a 34.40 price target for next year. So, I mean, it's pretty aggressively um, uh, you know, perspective for the for the next uh, for the next year. So, you know, what does that mean? I, I would expect a, a bit of a pullback would be fairly unexpected. And that's what concerns me if, if that would actually happen. So overall, the, the trend is pretty positive. I'm just going to bump it out to a little further. We'll go to let's see two years. And then I'll show show you what I was talking about there. So what what I was talking about on Bloomberg TV yesterday, I want to share with you now is just looking at 
where we're at relative to the 200 day moving average. So if you look at the difference between the price in the S&P 500 and the 200 day moving average, this distance, we're pretty far above the 200 day moving average. We've only been there a couple of times. If you look back over this period, we were there sort of in July, we were there back in April, uh, you know, not even quite up that far. And again, in September, these are the periods when we're really far away from the 200 day. You can see those have usually resolved lower and that's a general sense of momentum. It's, you know, the RSI is going to be overbought around those points as well. We have a bearish divergence on the uh, on the S&P potentially, depending on how things play out. We have that on Apple and Disney and others. So for me, I'm just I'm concerned about the limited upside based on how extended we are today. While it feels like a positive day, I feel that that just exaggerates this extension. So we'll have to see, you know, I, I obviously, you know, the, the price is king. As long as price is going higher, well, you have to be positive overall. The trend is positive, the long term trend. Let's go through the rest of the market recap here and then we're going to get to our next segment. So looking at the sectors here, energy up the most and we had a you know nice run in commodities and energy really reflecting that followed by financials and that two year chart of financials, the breakout that we've seen really, really impressive. We've seen a lot of individual names within the financial sector doing very well. And the materials number three, which is noteworthy on the bottom of it, we've got the defense. We have consumer staples, utilities, real estate. I want to show you the chart of real estate very quickly here just to show you where we're at real estate's actually breaking down to a new swing low it's at a new six month low and that's not true maybe a four month low going back here to august testing the 200 day very few sectors are doing that new relative strength breakdowns where they certainly a you know a one year low in relative strength so overall this really rotating away from the defensive side of the ledger more onto offense and today with the rally uh, you know really sort of uh sort of confirming that we don't have time to go through all the uh the scooter movers but i definitely uh, encourage you to pay attention to the right side here. These are the large cap stocks that are down the most. Couple names that are familiar to many of you, things like Facebook that were down uh, pretty big, a nice drop, and again, sort of a bearish engulfing pattern which suggests short-term weakness. Also the home builders, which have been some of the best charts and up until today have looked pretty attractive. Lennar is, is one of the weaker ones. You can see how far it down is, but even DR Horton, which has been at sort of at new highs, new closing highs yesterday, a lot of distribution today. So it may be a bit of a, uh, a change in some of the uh, the home builder names you want to pay attention to. We're going to move on to the next segment. I want to share with you what uh, the mystery chart uh, is looking like, and then we are going to unveil later in the show what the mystery chart actually is. So the way this goes, here is the chart. The question is, what is this? This is a tradable security in the U.S. That's all I'm going to tell you. And you've got the price and the 200-day and 15-day moving averages is going back about two years. And then you have the relative strength of that security versus the S&P 500. So you can see the underperformance for the last year and a half, and then the last three months starting to improve. So a bit of a reversal there. New highs today, along with many other things. The question is, what is this chart? If you have a guess, and I'd encourage you to please do so, go to the Q&A window on the, uh, on the TV screen, and you can uh, put in your guesses. Later in the show, we will share what that is and talk about why it's an important one. Our next segment is called Level Up. This is one of my favorite segments because it gets to highlight the strength of the stock charts system. And, uh, you know, again, we, we I like to show different parts of the stock charts platform, but what, anytime I can really dig in a little bit to some of the features you may or may not be familiar with, I think it would be really, really helpful. There's actually two that I wanted to go through very quickly for you uh, today on this level up segment. And if this is of interest, this sort of look through the product, uh, you know, the founder of stock charts, Chip Anderson on Saturdays does a really good job with his uh, all aboard stock charts. And then his deep dive show does a great job of highlighting the, the capabilities of the platform. So if you're not so familiar with some of these tools, I encourage you to check out uh, Chips videos are actually very, very well done. The first thing is actually called the Sharp Charts Voyeur. And it's basically the ability to look at other users and what charts they've created. So this is actually a live feed. It's a bit delayed. It's just showing you very quickly cycling through charts that other stock charts users have actually brought up on their login. We don't attribute this, they're completely anonymous. There's no way to tell who this is, what they're doing with it, what sort of conclusions they have, are they buying or selling? None of that is obviously part of this. And we take all the annotations off. So you, anything that would potentially identify who you are, or what you're thinking, those are all removed. It's just showing you things that you would draw on the screen. Um, so this is a really interesting way to see a couple of things. Number one, what tickers people are looking at, because when you find something that's sort of newsworthy, you'll find a lot of tickers start to pop up. Uh, and it's kind of interesting just to see uh, what others are, uh, are, are thinking. Um, number two, it's a great way to just see how people have their stock charts login set up. 
So you've probably gotten familiar if you watch the show for a while, just how I use the platform, what types of charts I use when I bring up a symbol, what sort of my default look with the moving averages and the relative strength. Here you actually get to do that with a lot of other people as well. So um, I found when I was just getting started using stock charts, and this is uh, a couple years ago, this was maybe early 2000s when I first started using uh, the platform, um, I found this was really helpful just to get ideas of how other people were, were using it and things like color schemes and chart styles and just how they were drawing things on the charts, where indicators were, uh, was really kind of helpful just to, to help me think about um, some ideas I may not have exercised uh, before. So if you're not familiar with this, it's again, it's it's a pretty simple uh, way to just get ideas, something fun to bring up uh, at, a, at an off time, a lighter volume time when you're not doing anything too crazy with your charts, just to see what others are doing, see if it gives you any ideas to um, to uh, to create your own. So that is the sharp, sharp charts voyeur um, uh, capability. The second thing I want to show you, and these are just a couple things that I, I that I know are on the platform that I don't think people are either are either aware of or that they use enough. The second one is called the dynamic yield curve, and it's really cool. This is actually one of the um, the the first times I came to stock charts was because someone said. You know, on stock charts, there's actually a way to look at the S&P 500 and look at the yield curve and see how they relate to one another. And this was, you know, almost 20 years ago. And I'm thinking, wow, that's actually really, really cool. So if you bring this up, click and it's, uh, animate, excuse me, what it's doing is it's showing you the current yield curve as of each of these historical dates. And it's starting back in 1999 where they, they started the clock and it's showing you a daily snapshot of the yield curve. This is a traditional way you look at the yield curve from short end to the long end. So this is the three month T-bill at the very left, and then it goes out to the long bond on the right. And so what you're seeing is this shape. Here we have the period in 2000 when the yield curve was actually inverted and the short end was above the long end. Now you can see the writing of the ship, the steepening of the yield curve as the interest rate differential increases, shorter, uh, uh, lower short-term rates, higher long-term rates. That is more of a healthy uh, overall configuration in general. And now you can see most importantly, you know, equity investors are always concerned, what does the yield curve mean to stocks? Now you can actually see how they relate to one another. What's really cool is at a market bottom, for example, I just hit snapshot at the, uh, at the uh, March 2003 low. The October 2002 low was the ultimate low. 2003, a little higher is that next higher low before we sort of launched off. I now have the one line which is stopped at that point. And now I can see how the yield curve has fluctuated relative to that starting point. And you can fast forward this. If you click around, you can switch the dates. So for example, if I go here to 2009, we'll get to the 2009 low. I can hit snapshot again. Fast forward that just a touch. Boom. So that's now the, uh, the snapshot at the low in 2009. And now I can see how the market, as the equity markets improved, what the yield curve did. So if you're trying to understand that relationship between interest rates, a steepening or a flattening or even an inverted yield curve, and how that relates to equity movements. This is a really fantastic visualization that Chip created years ago that is still so relevant. So those are two features as part of the level up segment. I, I hope you are able to use a little more of the sharp charts for you, see what see ideas from other stock charts users, and then the dynamic yield curve to really start to look at the uh, the yield curve relationship to the S and P 500. Two fantastic features uh, that you should be uh, you should be paying attention to on the product. We are going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to be back sharing with you part of my conversation with Tony Dwyer, really, really fantastic strategist. You're not going to want to miss it. So we'll see you in 30, minutes, uh, 30 seconds. Welcome back to the show. Uh, appreciate you joining us here on the final bar today and every day uh, uh, after the close. This is our, our way to uh, take the short term movements of the market on a day like today with plenty of volatility connected to the long term. Right? don't get too caught up in the short term flickering ticks, the movements. Think about the long term picture. I did want to highlight for everyone. There's an event coming up on January 4th. It's that first Saturday in the new year um, spearheaded by my stock charts. Uh, collaborator uh, Tom Boley, uh, who is from Earnings Beats, 
and also has done uh, the, does his shows on uh, Stock Charts TV. He is hosting an event uh, on uh, January 4th, which is featuring presentations from a number of Stock Charts contributors that you know, Mary Ellen McGonigal, Julius DeKempner, Greg Schnell, all of, all of the people that, have, that are hosts on the shows you're probably familiar with. I'm gonna be doing a webcast this coming Tuesday um, at 11 a.m. Eastern time, where I'm gonna just give you a, a little preview of what I'm gonna be talking about, thinking about investor routines and how to uh, have a better approach to, uh, to, uh, to the market. So please join me for that uh, as part of the preparation for the market vision event on January 4th of, uh, of next year. I want to share with you here a conversation I have with Tony Dwyer. Tony is the chief strategist at Canaccord Genuity, also at uh, DwyerStrategy.com. I asked him a, a number of questions. We had a fantastic interview, and we just want to take just a couple snippets, sh share with you uh, a couple minutes of content from him. Number one, I asked him about comparing where we're at relative to a historical period. His answer was fantastic. But also we talked about the toolkit, how it needs to evolve over time and sort of how that relates to what he's seeing in the markets right now. So here is my conversation, a bit of it, with Tony Dwyer from Canaccord Genuity. Here it is. You strike me, I mean, I followed your work for years back in my Fidelity days, used to love sitting down with you anytime I could. You always have struck me as someone who has a, a great read on market history, as you mentioned, just the historical ramifications. When you're looking at the markets now, sort of late 2019, you know, market at all time highs, is there a historical period or a uh, another time that this feels like or okay. looks like and why or why not? Buddy, this is, this is so exciting because yeah. so many people weren't in the, they remember the 1990s totally different than they believe than they actually happened. Right. It wasn't a straight up line. I mean, I, I remember almost losing my job in 1993 or four yeah. because Wall Street was so bad because of the pressure on commissions. Sound familiar? Right. So um, <laughs> what had happened is the Fed went into 1994 yeah. and doubled interest rates. Their last rate hike was early 1995, for February right. 1st of 1995. The yield curve got down to seven basis points. So you really right. came close to an inversion of the yield yep. curve, yep. 210 yield curve. And then Greenspan um, realized that he was so fearful of inflation, but there was no pickup in inflation. Right. And, he, and he knew that he had over tightened. So by the time the economic data started slowing in mid-95, they actually cut rates when the S&P was up. 1994 was a down year. Mm -hmm. 1995 was up 34%. And they cut yep. rates twice. What was interesting during that time, though, is Bill Clinton was being investigated for Whitewater. Paula Jones was suing him. There was a special prosecutor named. And it, to get out of the headlines, they started a trade war with Japan. Mm. So they threatened 100% tariffs on the top 13 Japanese cars. Yep. Right? So that, it's not so different than, than today. Eventually he got impeached, you know, which looks like a, an issue today as well. So there's a yeah. lot of similarities there. But that's when the Greenspan put was developed. Right. Greenspan right. said that he was going to protect from having too much downside without a lack of inflation. God, the mother of all Fed puts just got engaged. Right. You know, Powell just literally said, when somebody asked him at the press conference after the last FOMC meeting, what would make you raise rates? And he said, he said, you would have to have inflation go meaningfully above our target rate, which is 2%. Right. It's at 1.6% on the core PCE. Their own five-year forward break-even is 1.6%. Dude, uh, you know, if you want an average of 2% and you've got to get meaningfully above that, yeah. they may not be raising rates for the rest of my career, which most people say, okay, what, are you retire next year? Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> my lifestyle won't afford that. Right. <laughs> right? But at the, but at the mm. end of the day, that is like the mother of all Fed puts. That's right. They just yeah, yeah. told you. Yeah. They're not going to raise rates for the foreseeable future. What do you think drove the valuation of the market to 30 times earnings by 1999 or mm -hmm. 2000? Mm -hmm. You knew the Fed wasn't going to get in your face. That's right. The, the driver of the main declines of this cycle, whether it be the 2011 decline, the 2016 decline, or the 2018 decline, yeah. was all fear of tighter monetary conditions coming from the Fed. You know, we talked about the, you know, uh, the situation now with the Fed, the Fed put... Um, and comparing now to sort of that mid 90s period, but one very big difference, obviously, social media. So just in the last mm -hmm. week, you know, a single tweet or a rumor, you know, moving the markets up and down based on that. During your career, you've seen this influx of the of the impact of things like social media on mm -hmm. market movements. How has that changed your project process, or how have you adapted to 
what's happening, or have you just it, kind it, of gone straight through it? No, it really no doesn't do anything to it, Dave. Okay. I, if you think about all the craziness of the last two years, yeah, you had a down twenty percent move one year, and now you're up twenty five percent this year. Yep. A lot of tweets back and forth. What is the only thing that has ultimately mattered? The perception of, and direction of monetary policy. Right. 2018 right. was a result of a Fed that over tightened. 2019 is a, is a result of a Fed that has eased. So let's mm. talk about the trade war for a little bit because sure. people. So let's say um, a pair of jeans. What I, I have no idea what it's, what it's on. I don't really care. Yeah. Let's say a pair of jeans or the pink sweater costs an extra five bucks. Okay. Right or a Big Mac because of soybeans or whatever cost an extra thirty cents. Let's say it goes up five to ten percent. Yeah. Are you not going to spend money because of that? No. Okay. So then the next question becomes: If you just refinanced your mortgage and saved anywhere between five hundred and two thousand dollars a month, that is real. Mm. Right. The pair of jeans, the pink sweater, the Big Mac doesn't cost that much more and so many people just refinance their mortgage. Yeah. My, my um, uh, executive assistant, Kelly, who you, you guys talk to, yeah. she's actually my business manager, not my executive assistant. Mm -hmm. She just refinanced and she saved hundreds of dollars a month. We were at Fast Money one day, there was a technical guy there who heard us talking about it. He told us he saved $1,200 a month. <laughs> Anywhere between a few hundred and 1,200 yeah. is a lot of money. It's a number. It's yeah. not caught forever. Yeah. So the drop in interest rates that came with a weaker economy because of the trade war, people should be thanking the trade war right, because right, it right, gave right. them cheaper debt, companies as well. So yeah. you go into a recession, people, I think, totally screw this up. You go into a recession when companies need money and don't have access to it because mm. then they have to cut production, which hurts their suppliers. Yep. They have to lay people off, which hurts households. That's how you end up in a recession. Companies have total access to money right now. Yeah. And the only time that it stalled is because they didn't want to take the money, not because they couldn't get the money. Right. That's what investors should look for when they're looking for a recession. So a really cool conversation with Tony Dwyer. You just heard a snippet of it just a couple minutes. That was a, as part of a much longer 30 minute uh, interview. And we'll continue to take snippets of, of that one and share them with you. Um, you know, Tony is a really not knowledgeable guy. We were talking as the, as the video was playing. Tony, in my opinion, Tony knows a great deal about a great deal. And that is the truth. I thought his comparison of where we're at now versus the late 90s is really compelling for a number of reasons. But he talked about more of the, the, the strategy sort of macro side. I think from a technical side, similar things. And, and also a lot of, you know, technology stocks that started to look a certain way in the 90s, late 90s, 98, 99. You're starting to see some similarities with, uh, IPOs and uh, and uh, and venture capital names coming uh, coming public. So you know, really interesting to see that comparison. We'll have to see if that uh, plays out. Overall, you know, Tony is someone who is very constructive on the markets. And uh, even though I am less excited about the markets, I am very interested in what someone like him is thinking. So thanks again, Tony Dwyer from Canic or Genuity for uh, for his thoughts. Also, DwyerStrategy.com is a way to get a hold of him. Do you have a guess what the mystery chart was? Let's move on to the mystery chart segment. As always, this is a chart that if you're not looking at, I'd encourage you to start doing so. The, the hint was it is a US tradable security, which I know is not much of a hint because that's a lot of things. Uh, guesses we had, Bank of America, good. Uh, CN, CIN, okay, good. Uh, and VLUE, the value ETF. So. Team Final Bar, well done as always. The value ETF is absolutely correct. This is the VLUE, which is the value uh, factor ETF. And so this is essentially a play on value stocks uh, relative to other, other uh, parts of the market. We've talked about that growth value ratio before on the show. And we've had some guests talk about it. But if you just look at the factor ETFs, these are a group of, of things that I normally look at. And I have a um, chart um, uh, candle glance page that I look at all the time. So this is momentum, quality, size, which is essentially the smaller end, the smaller companies versus large, value, and then minimum volatility. This is the value ETF. When I was looking at this earlier, just kind of catching up on the markets, the value is the one that looks pretty constructive, right? A number of these are at new highs, but this is one that had been sort of a short-term base and now breaking uh, to new highs. So I was really interested when I brought up the individual chart seeing it break above the high from last fall, which is pretty noteworthy, but look at how the relative performance had been so bad. And this is when people are thinking value is dead, there's no more value. But if you look at the last three or four months, 
not too bad. And the relative strength in particular is showing higher highs and higher lows. It's pulled back a little bit as a lot of growth names were rallying, but just starting to turn higher. And again, that's one of those themes. I'm always looking for themes that I think others might not be there for. And I think people are unprepared for value stocks in general to do well, especially this time of the year when you're thinking it's more you know, small cap uh, performance, uh, you know, leading into the new year. So this is a theme I'd certainly encourage you to uh, to pay attention to if you haven't been uh, already. We're going to finish off today's show uh, with a three and three. As you know, at the end of every show, three charts in three minutes. If you're not looking at these charts up until now, I'd certainly encourage you to do so from here on out. So the first chart is the S&P 500. Showed you a different version of this chart. Uh, and again, I think one of the interesting uh, looks right now is where we're at relative to the 200 day moving average and the distance, how far we are away from that moving average, I think is really telling. If you look at the last couple times that we've been this far away from the 200 day, you can see that very soon after we've rolled over a little bit, we've had a bit of a pullback. Now, each one of those times, the trend, the, the primary trend has continued positively, right? So you pull back, but you, you find support either at the 200 day or through some price level and you continue higher. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if that's the sort of uh, look we get. But again, when you're that extended, it's sort of like when we're overbought with an RSI. We've moved so far from the average, you'd expect a little bit of a healthy pullback. And I think that's uh, what we're seeing on that individual chart there. The second chart, and again, and as much as I always talk about caution, I, I hear a lot of people that are very bold up. I hear people that are very positive on the market. So I'm always looking for sort of chinks in the armor. Where are potential themes or or charts or visuals that might give me an alternate view so I can be aware of that? This is one that does not agree. It's it's actually pretty positive. This is micro cap. So this is the IWC, which is the micro cap ETF. A lot of people look at uh, large, mid and small caps, but they forget about micro caps, a little less liquid, obviously a lot of different uh, you know things that you're, you're getting exposed to. But overall, this is a, a, an ETF that's now broken above Fibonacci resistance, which lines up from the uh, previous two peaks this year. It has now gone to new highs. Again, assuming we get some sort of follow through to confirm that overall in pretty good shape, just had a golden cross, which is a 50 crossing up through the 200 day. That is not, not my favorite indicator for predictive value, but I, I think it demonstrates the fact that the short term uh, has really has really strengthened. Nearing an extremely overbought condition, an RSI above 80, that usually tells you, you have, even if with a little bit of pullback, you can expect some further upside in micro caps on a relative basis, starting to look kind of interesting in the last couple of weeks. The third of the three and three is emerging markets EM. You had a lot of EM rally, obviously, with the China news. Chinese uh, ETFs are looking pretty good today, just with the nice, the nice bounce. But the overall EM index looking pretty good as well. And that also speaks to commodities, commodities, that GSCI commodity ETF uh, breaking out to, uh, to new swing highs. So right now, the EEM is at a crucial resistance level. This is the resistance from April and also from November. We're really testing the upper end there. And again, now we've rallied into resistance. So the question is whether or not we get the upside follow through on uh, on EM. So the, those are the three charts in three minutes as part of our three and three. Folks, that is our show for today uh, for the final bar. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate your flexibility here on location in New York. We're trying to bring you some really good live content, but also capture some really good co timeless content that we're going to share with you in the coming weeks. I'm really excited to share some of these interviews. And you're not going to want to miss the content we got from the New York Stock Exchange floor today. Please keep your questions coming. The final bar at stockcharts.com. We'll do a mailbag segment soon. Would love to incorporate your question. For stockcharts.com today in New York, I'm Dave Keller. Have a good night.